Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today is Mads Christensen. Mads, Hello. welcome back to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's been a while. Yeah, I and, think uh, March was the last and time. And in that while, you've no doubt written a whole bunch of extensions. I have. So the way it works is Mads goes and writes a whole bunch of, ex is constantly writing extensions, mm -hmm. and then every now and then, either I ping him or he pings me, and you come on the show and show us what you've been working on. Yeah, so I'm going to just show some of them. Okay. Because I, so I, I looked at sort of what I've done this you year. You get your own show, and Mads' I, uh, extensions. Almost, because <laughs> it, I think I write an extension every two weeks, like oh, on average okay. in this calendar year. So um, there's a lot of there stuff, and we're going to skip some of them. All right. And look at sort of the, the show more us the general, highlights, the good yeah, ones. Yeah, the highlights. All right, yeah. just the good ones. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> All right. Yeah, right. Um, so let's just jump into it. All right. Okay, so let's take a look here. This is uh, an extension that I wrote called uh, File Icons. So one thing that is, you know, my extensions always have boring names. Mm. I realize this. They always just have the, they always just describe what they are, right? <laughs> There's nothing, <laughs> yeah. So file icons add icons to files, okay. <laughs> right? It's pretty simple. <laughs> but you, uh, undoubtedly, if you're a Visual Studio user, you've noticed that some files, they don't have an icon in Solution Explorer. They just mm -hmm. have sort of the default white icon, and Visual Studio says, oh, I don't know what that is. Right. And so here I have uh, languages. Check this out. Ooh. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. So what is happening here is that this extension I have uh, maps file extensions to icons. And some of the icons Visual Studio already has built in, and so it just reference the existing icons. Mm -hmm. And some icons are for something that is not supported at all in Visual Studio, and so they're custom. And so here we have a list of a lot of the custom ones. And so did you make up these icons? So you decided that, oh, well, dot .pug obviously is a dog. That's a jade file, yeah. Okay. So the yeah, so these are like the official icons, okay. right, for these different languages or file types. Um, so this is what they look like. This is, uh, but this is very very nice. It's you know if you're dealing with other file types mm -hmm. than you know the usual suspects, um, this is just nice. And um, actually, so here's the GitHub repository. So all these extensions that I write, they're always open source. This one is called File Icons, and if we look at just the different files here. There's over 350 uh, file icon mappings. So these are, this is a long list. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's something that I, you know, ultimately I want this just to be in Visual Studio. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to have. So even though there might not be support for the language, right, at least we can show the icons to say, okay, right. we, we know that this is a Perl file or a Haskell file. And then if you wanted to use your own icons, you could just edit the source code? Or is there a, oh, a dialogue to here. do that mapping yourself? Well, you cannot do that mapping, unfortunately. But let's take a look here. So, but I kind of, I kind of build in a, like a thing. So let's say, let me just add a file here. Let's add uh, something that doesn't exist, right? Okay. So, test dot Robert. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where did that go? Let's see here. Somewhere under T, at the very bottom. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so here this one, this has that you know, default icon. We don't right. know what this is. But you can right click this thing, and at the very top you can report ah. missing icon. So if ah, we click okay. that, it basically, what, is the internet broken? <laughs> it appears to be, okay. I'm not, I'm not on, yeah, I can see my internet's not here. Anyway, that's not important. The important part is, what it does is that it takes you to GitHub, and it opens an issue saying, missing support for .robert files. Okay. And then I pick that up, I find out, okay, what's the appropriate icon, and I release a new version of the extension that okay. automatically gets into Visual Studio, right? Visual okay. Studio auto-updates extensions. Right. And so, a week later, you're going to have, you're going to open this project, and all of a sudden you have an icon for okay. .robert files. But you could, uh, you could add the ability to add your own custom icon if you wanted to, right? Uh, could you? No. No. Oh. I don't think you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is all. <laughs> this is all like something that has oh, to be it's, registered it's with Visual Studio. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So it yeah. can't be swapped out at runtime. It's no, unfortunately, hard coded. No. Oh, yeah. bummer. All right. Yeah, yeah. So that's how Visual Studio works in this case, and that's why I think this extension is so interesting because mm -hmm. it just lists like as I said, 350 yeah, cool. of them, and like every week the list grows and grows. Right. So <clears throat> that's kind of nice. Now. So that's kind of cool. You are going to create a dot Robert file and put my face on I it. I right? should do that. <laughs> I should do that, like a little Easter egg. Yeah. Um, now, for some of these uh, files, like we don't have uh, in Visual Studio, there's no 
extension or no, there's no native support in Visual Studio for a lot of these languages, right? right? Like Haskell and Scala and so on. And um, it would be really nice if we could get at least syntax highlighting and maybe even snippets mm -hmm. for these files. And so let's open this Perl file, perl.pl right here. Um, so what um, Visual Studio 2015 has, which I think very few people are aware of, is that it has support for text-made bundles. And t a text-made bundle is something that was born for the text-made editor, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's basically either a JSON or an XML definition file that describes a language. So what are the keywords, what are, you know, how does syntax highlight a language, yeah, cool. right? And also it can has, have snippets and other things. And so Visual Studio actually has support for this. And so I have an extension called uh, the Syntax Highlighter Pack that basically just adds a lot of these text-made bundles. So for instance, for Perl, let's just zoom in here, you know, I can get snippets. Ooh. And so there's one called Test. And you see here, and we even get like the full snippet. I can move between these here, right? Nice. So that's kind of cool. So I get full syntax highlighting for languages that are not traditionally supported in Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. So you can see this extension married with the file icons extension provides like a bunch of really nice features to VS for working with languages. So did you, how many languages did you get supported for in that extension? Um, I think I'm close to 50. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's, at least, it's 45 to 50, I think, right now. And did you have to create the XML files yourself, or did they exist somewhere? They exist. I don't, I actually don't know how to create those files. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could learn. Like, it's uh, basically some regexing yeah. and stuff you okay. need to specify. So, it's, it's doable. But somebody already did the work. Someone did the work. Okay, cool. And when you open a file that Visual Studio has no idea what it is, like, it's plain text, like a dot .robert file. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, because I've had this extension, I don't see it right here, but if I just installed the extension, I would get a little alert that says, hey, you can now, when you open a file that we don't know about, mm -hmm. you can right-click inside the editor and report missing language ah, for dot .robert files. Cool. And just like the file icons, if you click this, it will open GitHub and create a, an issue on mm -hmm. the GitHub repo for this. And I think I've at least 10, if not more, 20, um, languages have been added by people raising the issue on GitHub Very through nice. this button right here. Very nice. So it's kind of a cool way to, to add features. Yeah. Like the users literally ask specifically for the, the individual languages. So that's cool. kind of cool. Uh, so that list is going to keep on growing. Yep. And those are also, so Visual Studio supports it, but also like Sublime Text, Visual Studio mm -hmm. Code, TextMate, Atom, Brackets, all these different editors all support right. TextMate bundles. So there's a lot of them out there. But I don't just blindly take all of them. Yeah. You know, I have to test them out. Do they work? There are limits in what Visual Studio supports. Mm -hmm. So I have to test each individual language. Okay. So that was those two extensions. Let's mm -hmm. uh, create a new file in here. Um, you know, like you have .gitignore files yep. and all that. So there's also .tfignore. So let's just add one of those. You see here it actually, of course it gets a nice icon yeah. because I have the file icons extension. But this file is used for me to when I, you know, commit to source control, I can say ignore certain files right. and folders. And the problem is uh, how do you know that whatever you type in this file actually hits files and folders that you have. Let me illustrate. Hmm. So I'm going to just zoom in here. So let's take a look at this. Um, actually, this I should have put this file in the root of my project. So let me just do that. Uh, let's just close it. So here we go. So in the root of my project, I got a few folders. I got views. Let's say I want to ignore views. Mm -hmm. I would simply go in here into my TF ignore and write views. Okay. Now let's say that let's say I made a mistake. I made a typo here. It get grayed out like this. Ah. Okay. So I can fix it like this, and mm -hmm. if I hover it, it will show me exactly what files it hits. Cool. Isn't that nice? Yes. And you know, and of course I can just search in here, and it's super fast. Nice. And I can also, if I then click one of these files here. You see Solution Explorer? Uh -huh. It synchronizes. Nice. So I can very okay. easily find and identify these files. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really nice. And if I have something that doesn't exist, right? This doesn't exist. Right. This file, for instance. I get a light bulb, so I can say, hey, remove 
this specific entry mm -hmm. or remove all non-matching. So it will go through my entire ignore file, whether it's tf ignore, git ignore, npm ignore, like there's a lot of dot ignore files. Right. <laughs> and it will just remove all the entries that don't point to anything. Excellent. Right, so you can clean it up and, and verify that everything is, is as tight as it can possibly get. Cool. So this is an extension called dot ignore. Okay. Like not dot, but the, you know, the, the dot. Dot. <laughs> dot ignore. Okay, so let's close out all of this. Let's look at another language that that's in here, Markdown. So this is an extension called Markdown Editor, which again, very creative naming. <laughs> it's an editor for Markdown. And um, it's actually really cool. Uh, it supports the full GitHub flavor of Markdown, plus an additional, some additional syntaxes. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of it just being a plain text editor with a preview, which is sort of what you see here, you have the text on the left, the source, yeah. and you see the browser rendered HTML on the right. We have a lot of uh, things we can do here. For instance, Here's a checkbox list. If I hit control space, it checks it for me. I don't have to manually go in here and you know mark this yeah. with an X, right? Okay. I have a shortcut, control space. Also, if I want this to be bold, control B. Right. So the, these sort of text editing we know from Word and whatnot mm -hmm. are carried over here. Um, so that's really, really nice. I automatically get completion if I'm writing a list here. So Foo bar, hit enter, it will inject the three dot for me here. So we can do something like this. And notice how as I type, yeah. the preview updates. I don't have to um, save or anything, it's as I type, which is really nice. Does it teach you the markdown syntax or does it expect you're familiar with it? Um, it does not teach. Okay. So, but it does a little bit actually. So let's uh, look at a feature here. So notice here now I scroll. As I scroll the source, the preview scrolls right. uh, instantly with me. So I always see cool. the preview mm -hmm. of what I'm currently editing, which is nice. But here's where it helps you. Let's say I want to add an image to this file. Mm -hmm. And say, I'm just going to create an image here. I'm going to just do a, I have a little image selector tool here. So let's grab this, copy it. So now I have an image in my clipboard. Mm -hmm. I can simply just go in here and just paste it in, control V. And it will now ask me, where do I want this image? Let's just call it file. It's automatically created, put on disk, and referenced. Mm -hmm. And we even have validation here. So if I make a typo, I get an error. So that's kind of nice. Cool. I could also go the other way around. Let's say I have an image already. So let's see, file. I can right click this, or not right click. I can use the light bulb, say convert this to an image. And it will then ask me, well, where is the image? Well, in this case, I put it here, you know, and I get the mm -hmm. same thing. And you know, it, I can do a lot of other things in here, convert it to a link. So all these special syntaxes, there are uh, very easy shortcuts okay. to do that. Sweet. So I learn as I go along. Yep. Yep. And of course, there's uh, full syntax highlighting as well. So here I have a C-sharp code snippet. You know, I can see you get sort of a, a nice uh, view yep. here. Yep. So um, you can add custom style sheets, all these sort of things you would expect from a Markdown answer, and it's this is my primary. After I build this, and there's a uh, something called MarkDig, which is a .NET Core uh, parser for Mark uh, for Markdown that's mm -hmm. relatively new. Okay, it's like by far the best on the .NET platform that supports all this, and um, that's what's under the hood, right? So it's it's super fast, all async, uh, very very nice. Very nice. Yep. All right. Let's um, let's look at another one. This is this is an extension that I has been out for like some years, like three years or something like that. Okay. But recently, I took over the sort of stewardship or ownership of it because the original author is no longer uh, maintaining it, and I asked, "Can I take it over so I can maintain mm -hmm. it?" And it's called multi editing. I've kind of renamed it to be multi select mode just because I have to have a boring name, yep. right, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but it allows you basically to have multiple cursors. Oh. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so this is a, 
Yeah, so it, it already has a lot of downloads. People really love this. Yeah. How many can you have at a time? As many as, as, you, many want. as you want. Wow. Yeah, there's no limit to this. Isn't that cool? That is nice. Yeah. So it's been out for, for years, as I said, and it okay. has like it has a decent amount of downloads, but not a lot of people know about this. And yeah. this is something we keep hearing that people love from, let's say, Sublime Text, yeah. that they have this capability of having multiple carrots so and multi selection. So better than having to figure out the replace all to use to get text like that in multiple places. Right. Nice. All right. So let's go back here. Let me open another file here. It actually doesn't matter. I'm just going to pin it. You know the pinning feature mm -hmm. of Visual Studio yeah. here? That's really nice. You just pin it right there, right? So now it stays there. Uh, it's always to the left. Yeah. Now, the thing is, though, that if we look at my project here in Solution Explorer, like, it's all expanded. Look at all this stuff, right? I'm just expanding all this. So this is, might be how I leave my project. So now I'm done for the day and I leave my project like this. Mm -hmm. I come in the next morning and open the solution again and it's like, oh, now I need to like collapse everything and find it. Yep. You know this problem? Yep. <laughs> it's more of a nuisance. Maybe the problem is a little bit of an overstatement. But to me, that's sort of annoying. I want the fresh look of it. I want all this stuff collapsed. Right? I, w I don't want anything open unless okay. I pinned it. If it, I pinned right. it, I want it open. Okay. But all, everything else should just be closed. Can you so, anticipate my feature request yet? <laughs> Something to do with restart? Mm, roaming. Roaming. Is this this might be Isn't that this wrong? might be support? It could be. Could be. I'm not certain. Yeah. I don't know how Wouldn't settings that be are awesome roamed. If that roamed. I could it I think if you use the Visual Studio APIs for storing settings, which yeah. I do. They may be wrong. It's not something I can, as okay. an extension author, right, determine. Right, right. It'd have to be something that that is in settings. Right. That'd be cool. But it could be depending on where the location of the setting is. Yeah. I should look into that. Okay. Anyway, let's anyway, close this. showing the feature. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped ahead. <laughs> so now you see it's all expanded. Right? Yep. But let's just uh, let's close the solution. Okay. The yep. solution is closed. Nothing out of the ordinary. Until we open it again. The exact same solution. Notice that now it's only my file here that's open. The mm -hmm. other file that was open is now closed. Yep. And everything over here is collapsed. Okay? Right. So I get a fresh start. Pretty simple. Cool. And it's like, it's one of those things that uh, it's always kind of annoyed me. Mm -hmm. And so I built it. it. Not a lot of people downloaded this. I mean, this, it's for people that are like an OCD like myself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but this, is, this might be my favorite extensions of all time. Okay. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Something as simple as this. All right. It's in my top five, I'll say that. Interesting. Yeah. It's called Clean Solution. Okay. Clean Solution. And there are tools options. You can say, do you want the projects to be collapsed? Do you want solution folders to be collapsed? Ah. Do you want Solution Explorer to take focus when you open the solution? Mm -hmm. And I do this, uh, I set that to true. I want Solution Explorer to have focus because oftentimes when I open something, yes. like Team Explorer is open or the properties window, and I just want Solution Explorer to be right. open. So now it does that. And that's kind of very nice. Yep. It kind of just gets it, it just makes it ready to be used, right. I guess, you know? Yeah. Hit the ground running. So, speaking of that, you know, sometimes you create a new file and there, there are comments in there. Mm -hmm. Or you, you take over a, a file that someone else wrote, and there's a lot of comments on how to do it and how you know to teach you how this file was built or whatever, right? right? Yep. And so, uh, for instance, here there are some comments in this file. There are three comments actually. This is a C# -sharp file. It could be any file. Um, it doesn't really matter, but it has comments in it. So I can say Control K Q and just get rid of all the comments. Ooh, isn't that isn't that neat? Uh, but the way it happens is, um, where do you go? Here we go, comments, right? Remove all comments. Uh -huh. Only remove the XML doc comments, or remove everything but the XML doc comments. Okay. Right, and you can also remove regions. Mm. This is um, something I get asked about every now and again. And then it saves them in memory until you save the file? When do you lose it for good? Well, yeah, it, it updates the text buffer, so the file is okay. dirty. You have to save it right. to, okay. to make the change. Right? You can always undo it. Yeah. There's, there's no difference between this and other text right. edits in the editor. Yep. But remove regions does not mean remove content of the region. Right. <laughs> Only remove the region uh, lines themselves, yes. right? The yep. region and the end region. Yeah. So it's just one of those 
things that you know I actually use way more often than mm -hmm. I thought. I did this for a specific exercise that I did at a conference at one point, but I find myself using it at least once a week. Okay. So I kind of like that. Um, but speaking of like editing in the text uh, editor here, right? Um, let's uh, let's make some formatting mistakes. Okay. So let's say here, this is this is a badly formatted document right now. Mm -hmm. I think we should probably zoom a little bit. So be busy. Okay. <clears throat> this is very very bad, and I should format the document. And so to format the document, I don't remember the shortcut, right? So I go to... Really? It's one of the few that I do remember. I actually, well, <laughs> I do actually do remember it, but just for the case of the argument, let's say I don't. Um, there's, a, there's like five I remember. That's one of them. <laughs> but it could be anything that I... Any command that I execute mm -hmm. that has a shortcut associated with it but I choose to find the button and click it with the mouse instead. Okay. Okay. In this case, format document, I'm going to click it with the mouse and it formats the document, but at the bottom, it tells me, oh, I hit edit.format document, which has this um, shortcut. Okay. Okay. So it reminds me, if I need to, if I want to learn what the shortcuts are for the stuff that I normally do, I'll look here, and now it goes away. So I set it to 15 seconds. So do we do it again? To the edit menu. Uh huh. Because it tells you right there. Right. Okay. So you're repeating it. Yes. Well, not every. Well, yes, <laughs> but not everything is shown, right? Not, oh. not, you don't. Not every command everywhere has this shown. But even if it did. There are commands with shortcuts, and the shortcuts don't show up in the menu. Yeah, not all commands are have menus, right? For instance. Oh. Okay. But. It right. will show you right here, right? And then we'll go away after 15 seconds yep. this case. By okay. default, five seconds. Okay. But I can always go in and see the history uh, of the different things I did. So, oh, I did that, okay. that specific one a lot. I should probably learn that one, right? Yeah. And so this All is right. just a tool if you want to learn shortcuts. Okay. It's sort of a very simple now I get it. Uh, teaching tool. Yep. Right. If you want to, we know from telemetry uh, of the Visual Studio usage that people don't use a lot of shortcuts. Like right. way fewer than you would think. Like like two. Like yeah. the average is like two keyboard shortcuts yeah. per person, right? That they know. Control Shift B is uh -huh. one of them. <laughs> Control C. <laughs> yep. uh, so this is basically just a friendly reminder. Hey, there's a shortcut for what you did. You know, maybe you wanna maybe you wanna learn how to use it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it's like one of those small little nice helpers. And I always have it there because sometimes I actually. Don't know the shortcuts, or right? Things, right. So, even though I try to use, but as it's much, nice if you as many it's as keeping I can. track of, of what you do and suggesting which ones that if you learn this shortcut, you could save yourself quite a bit of time of hunting and pecking on menus. Right. All right, that's cool. And there are settings you can you can specify whether do mm -hmm. you want to print it out in the output window as I do here? Do you want yep. like how long should the thing be in the status bar, mm -hmm. or should it never go away? You can also yep. just have it all there uh, all the time. Or if you're yep. Asked 25 times and don't use the keyboard shortcut, it'll automatically move the mouse off the menu and force you <laughs> yeah, to learn it. That would be, that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, oh, maybe I just want the output thing. I don't want the status bar thing. You can right. also set that up. Yep. Right? So, you know, however you learn best, this, you can configure this for it. Cool. All right. So, <clears throat> these were all like general purpose mm -hmm. extensions. But I am a web guy. Like, yes. You know, deep down inside, I am a web developer and a web. I work on the web team, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I I have to do something with web every once in a while, you know. Uh, even though that what I showed here also works for all web developers, obviously, right? Yes. It works for everyone, I'd say. Um, but I do have a few uh, few things that is interesting specifically for web developers. And I think at the show we did like a year ago, I think I showed you the image optimizer, how mm -hmm. to really compress and optimize the images in your project to yeah. save bandwidth. Or file size, you know. Yep. Um, but there's a tr other trick we use in web development, which is called image spriting, which is the process of taking, let's say, three images mm -hmm. and combine them into one image, and then using CSS to move the background position um, to match just the sim that single image that's inside the large image. Right. And the point of that is that by serving only one large image, that's only one HTTP request right. instead of three individual ones. And so it's faster reload times, those sort of things, yep. right? It's an optimization thing. But they're really difficult to do. 
Because one thing is you have to create the image by itself. You have to combine the images, basically. Mm -hmm. That's one exercise. The other exercise is, well, how do you write that CSS? Yep. Right. And what if you don't want to use CSS, but you want to use SAS or less? Then what? So, so these ones are icons. You see here, if I hover, you get a little mm -hmm. icon here. So now, I have an extension here called Image Sprite, or Image Sprites, because that's what it does. <laughs> <laughs> and I can simply say, create Image Sprite. Ooh. And it will ask me, what do you want to call this? My sprite, dot sprite, that's fine. That's what it suggests. And here I get a sprite file, which is the JSON file. And a few things happen. It creates a PNG file, and then it optimizes it using that image optimizer. We can see that just happened right okay. here. Okay, so that happened right here. 29%. So I'm up to, I create a PNG out of those three source files. And you can see it listed here. It has all there three of them. Okay. Right? Um, and it gave me a style sheet, a CSS file. So I can now include this as part of my payload as, or as my, my part of my CSS bundling nice. mechanism. And okay. I now have uh, what I need to do to consume this image sprite. But as I said, I didn't want to use CSS, potentially. I want to use something else. So I, in my sprite file, mm -hmm. this is how I define this. I said, oh, I want it to produce a less file. I can also do one PNG. Should we have a GIF or a JPEG? What's the output? Mm -hmm. And then when I, op uh, when I optimize the images, should it do it lossless or lossy? Lossy will give you more compression, yep. but you sacrifice quality a little bit, whereas lossless is no change to the quality. Right. Uh, so let's just keep it at that. Orientation, which way do we want it to go? Let's change that. Keep PNG. And here is the list of the files. Mm -hmm. So I can at any point in time add another icon and just add the entry in here. I can actually just drop it if I take a, uh, an image file here and drop it in. So I already had this time, so it just gives me like a random mm. string here. Okay. But I can just drag it in and it will be part of my sprint because as soon as I save the file, we can now see that I have a horizontal list mm -hmm. here yeah. and I have an image There's sprite less, file. less cool. file created. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So this is just one of those things that people don't do because it's too hard to do. Right. Not anymore. Now it's easy. Yeah. Awesome. So that is, that is just nice. I like that. That's something that helps me, you know, right? That's usually why I write extensions, because I have a need for yes. something, <laughs> and then I, I figure out that I should probably write the extension. We're moving fast here through a lot of stuff. Um, have you ever wondered, Robert, when you're building applications, any type of applications, you're using packages that other people wrote? I love it. Wondered right? about that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it could be a NuGet package, mm -hmm. it could be a Bower NPM package. But how do you know that, uh, you know, any package that you use with that version of that package doesn't contain security vulnerabilities? Ooh, okay. Right? Think enterprise or think, you know, where you want to have some restrictions on, you only want to use things that are, doesn't have yeah. any known vulnerabilities. I think that makes sense in most cases, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I built this thing called package security alerts. Again, <laughs> that's exactly what it does. And here's a Bower file. Oh, so, look at that. Look at that. So you get little alerts here about like some packages that have security issues. So this works for Bower and for NPM. And where is this information stored? This information comes from retired JS. So okay. there's an existing repo that, that are being used for Gulp files and for other Node.js, basically in the Node world, I'd say mostly. Mm -hmm. Um, but as part of that, there's a JSON file with all the definitions. Like, here are all the packages, and here are the ranges of versions that have vulnerabilities. Okay. And here are the link to where the vulnerability and the fix is described. Okay. And so we can say, is something a high security risk, or medium, or low? So if that gets fixed, then uh, that would go away at some point? Yeah, we can fix this. So, uh, so if I click this, it says, oh, this has... Uh, risk level high. Yeah. Right. Oh. So at the time, so let's say whoever wrote that package, did they, they wouldn't fix one three one, or would they just make a one three two? They would make a one three two. That's okay. like the December 
uh, you, like semantic versioning, right. you have to create So it. even though it is a security vulnerability, you leave it out there and it's just no longer the latest version. Right. They're actually good at then putting them down, taking them out of the, like right. the NPM okay. or Bower registries, yep. okay. but not in all cases. So Got for it. Bower here, it still exists. Okay. Um, and if I click it, it opens the, uh, the description of, of what it is. Yeah. See here, there, mm -hmm. the complete description of it. There's even like PDF files and stuff to, um, oh, not, not diff files, sorry, not PDF files, uh, to show what the problem is and how, mm -hmm. how to fix it and all that sort of stuff. But usually the way to fix it is uh, just to update it to the latest, right? So let's take that one and see that it goes yep. away immediately. Cool. So this is just a very nice way to, you know, making sure. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you'll never see that. Right. Right, but it's something that's really nice to have, um, yeah. just in case. And what's the uh, the information icon? What does that tell me? This one. Yeah. This one is a warning. So okay, it, medium. It has okay. medium. Yeah. Right. Right. Got it. So maybe I should make it more clear in the message here. If it's higher medium, make it bold or something like that. Yeah, because would you leave a medium security issue in your code? Well, I would say no. You wouldn't. There's yeah. the low risk where it's like. For your information, right. if you use it in a certain way, which you may not do, yeah. then there could be a potential thing. Right. Right? Uh, I think medium is, there's something here, but it's, um, it requires more effort to exploit. Okay. Okay. And then high is like, okay, you're, right. you're just that's open fair. to failure here. Yeah. So, um, but that's why you just click the icon, it right. takes you and, and you can told. read about. Right. This, so this extension makes no effort in trying to give you recommendations. Right. Because it's, it's just, all, it's different it's just from. just informational. Yeah, it's different right. from each security vulnerability, yes. how to mitigate yep. it and all those things. So yep. uh, it's just for information, right? It's a, it's a packet security alert. Alert, it's an alert. <laughs> and that's also <laughs> the name of the extension. Very nice. So um, that's kind of nice. Do we have time for one more? Of course. Okay. Uh, so this is, an, this is an oldie but goodie, mm -hmm. um, but it's been updated. It's the one called package installer. Mm -hmm. let's, let's take a look at what that is. <clears throat> So if I right-click my project, I can say quick install package mm -hmm. or hit shift alt zero. And it gives me this thing. And it's basically a way for me to very quickly install a package from NPM or Bower or NuGet or TSD mm -hmm. um, into my project. So, it, so for NuGet, it installs a NuGet package just as it would have done if I went to you know, manage NuGet packages right. and would search or use the command line to do install package and all that. But if you know the one you want, like JSON.net, yeah, right? right? Which I've added, you know, we've all added to projects over and over and over and over right. and over again. This is quicker than going to the package manager, yes. although it, it by now shows up immediately. Right. But something like SQLite, right? If you know what you want, it just makes it a lot faster to go and get. But as a brand new thing, we now have Yarn support. So Yarn. <laughs> Because you can never have too many package managers. Right. <laughs> and Well, the funny thing about Yarn is, let me explain to you what it is. Okay. It's actually pretty simple. It's an alternative to NPM. So it uses the NPM registry. Mm -hmm. The content of the packages that you get down are the exact same ones. But instead of using the NPM CLI tool under the hood, it uses the Yarn tool. Okay. Which is a new thing that Facebook and other like Google, I know the Angular team has been involved in. Uh, it's a lot faster, it does caching better, it does um, shrink wrap, if you know what that is, for how to lock certain versions so mm -hmm. you can never, so the versions never slide based on semantic versioning. It does a lot of things better than NPM. Okay. And so just to show that, we can, we can select that and we can, we've still got full IntelliSense, right? We can say, give me jQuery. And um, you know, it now says here what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Installing jQuery packets from Yarn. And done. Right? That was it. Cool. So that was kind of nice. So, um, yeah, just an update to, an, to one that I think last time I actually yeah, uh, yeah. demoed this particular yeah. extension. But uh, it's always nice. Like for me, it's like really important to always be up to date and maintaining these like a lot. Right. So I never let any of my extensions go stale. Like if you look at it, there, none of them have been updated. Like they're all like in the last month or last two months. Right. So they have to stay relevant mm -hmm. and uh, all this sort of stuff. So this is just to demonstrate that, uh, yep, we can react to the market and when something new comes out, awesome. we add the support as needed. You know? Cool. Yeah. All right. Always so fun. Always a great time. Oh, yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. We will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.